Good afternoon. I am Harry Poston of the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut, and it is my honor to welcome you to our department and to our seventh Pfizer colloquium. These colloquia are supported by Pfizer Central Research, and they bring to Connecticut the finest internationally recognized scientists in the field of statistics. Today we are fortunate to have as our guest and speaker the distinguished expert in sample surveys, Morris H. Hansen. Because of the importance of this event, we are videotaping the presentation for the archives of the American Statistical Association. Professor Alan Gelfand of our department will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Harry. I join Harry in welcoming you all to this, the seventh Pfizer Colloquium. These colloquia have sampled from the most eminent statisticians in the world, Neyman, Rao, Cremer, Noether, Eisenhart. Each speaker has provided us with a sample of his available reminiscences, and it is fitting that our speaker today, Morris H. Hansen, joins this assuredly non-random sample since he is recognized worldwide as a leader in the field of sampling. Morris Hansen joined the U.S. Bureau of Census in 1935, exactly 50 years ago. Shortly after his arrival, the Bureau began a limited and experimental research program on sampling and its potential uses. One notable outcome was the 1937 enumerative check census, which effectively measured the extent of unemployment. Morris was a primary participant in the development of this sophisticated sample survey, which is now viewed as a landmark in official statistics. The 1940 census saw the first use of sampling as a part of a decennial census, with Morris Hansen again a major contributor. 1940 also saw the beginning of his research collaboration with William Hurwitz. This collaboration produced a fundamental paper in the 1943 Annals of Mathematical Statistics entitled On the Theory of Sampling from Finite Populations. It also produced several major articles on measurement error, accuracy, and non-response in survey data. And with William Maddow as a third author, produced a two-volume text on sample survey methods and theory. Uh, this two-volume work has been a standard reference in sampling since its appearance. In 1968, after 33 years with the Census Bureau, Morris retired as Associate Director of Research and Development. He then joined the Westat Research Corporation, where he is currently Senior Vice President, and where 50 years from the start of his career, he continues his research activity. Among the many honors he has received are Fellow and President of the American Statistical Association, Fellow and President of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, President of the International Association of Survey Statisticians, Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Honorary Member of the Royal Statistical Society, Honorary Member of the International Statistical Institute, Member of the National Academy of Sciences, and listing as one of the 62 contributors to major social science advances in the 20th century. It is indeed a pleasure to present to you Morris Hansen, who will speak to us today on some history and reminiscences on survey sampling. Thank you. It's a real pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to participate in this Pfizer Colloquium. I've had the opportunity to view several of the tapes from earlier colloquia and was impressed by and pleased to see that kind of a product that's come out of this Pfizer support. When I joined the Bureau of the Census in 1935, the Bureau was in the beginning stages of a transition from a staid old line organization to an innovative organization that was to stimulate the development and make significant contributions to various aspects of the theory and practice of designing and taking sample surveys and censuses. The Bureau had already done pioneering work in the development, construction, and application of punch card data processing equipment, but was relatively lethargic in other areas. I was fortunate to join the Bureau at a time when opportunities were open. A young member of an evolving team that was prepared to create and take advantage of opportunities that occurred. The New Deal and shortly thereafter World War II both created many of these opportunities for statistical development. <coughs> 
I'll make a few brief remarks on the history of sample surveys prior to this time and continue by summarizing a few of the highlights of early contributions to survey sampling and census methods and theory generally, including especially the work at the Bureau of the Census. It's important to distinguish two distinct types of inferences based on sample survey and census results. The first is descriptive. The aim is to describe the characteristics of a specified finite population. For this case, a complete census is sometimes available or in principle could be taken. If the census covers the desired subjects and is complete and accurate, it would be sufficient. Ordinarily, a complete census is not feasible, especially providing for providing current information on many studies and topics. And a sample survey is used to provide estimates of what would be obtained or obtainable by a complete census. The second type of inference is concerned with the causes that produced certain characteristics of that finite population, of a finite population. Such problems may be particularly important, but inference also may be more difficult. The distinction between the two types of inference is sometimes not clearly recognized, especially since both may use the same data and essentially the same methodology. My discussion, except where specifically indicated otherwise, will relate to the first of these problems, that is, inference or estimating the characteristics of a well-defined finite population. There are many illustrations of early applications of sample methodology, both in Europe and in the United States, and I'm sure elsewhere, during the 19th century and even earlier. Stefan gives a intensive review. Many of the methods used were conceived as desirable or useful on intuitive grounds and applied in some of these early surveys, but with little or no support and guidance from theory. The methods applied included stratification, cluster and multi-stage sampling, post-stratification, and others. Kier from Norway in a 1897 paper gave a relatively sophisticated discussion of the principles and uses of such methods, including some recognition of issues and limitations, and also presented recommendations to the International Statistical Institute concerning the use of sampling to acquire information. Bowley supported Kyer's recommendation, and in 1903, the International Statistical Institute, the ISI, passed a resolution supporting the use of the representative method. A commission was appointed in 1924 that made a number of important recommendations, and Bowley's 1926 memorandum in the commission's report emphasized the need for random selection of the sample. He also emphasized the need for some kind of a comprehensive list from which to draw the sample, covering the population. And this list could either be of elements or of clusters from which to draw the sample so that random or systematic samples, sampling procedures could be implied, systematic being treated as equivalent to random. He gave the theory for proportionate stratified sampling and emphasized that non-response may be a problem that needs attention. In the United States in the early and mid-1930s, the Great Depression and the New Deal programs that went with it, including especially the Federal Emergency Relief Administration and the Work Projects Administration, known as the WPA, needed various types of information. Such needs stimulated and provided support for, an <coughs> for a number of sample surveys. A wide range of surveys was taken, often using systematic and random sampling methods sometimes within purposefully selected areas. A new era was introduced in the 1920s with the remarkable developments in statistical theory and practice by R.A. Fisher at the Rothamsted Experimental Station. Among other things, Fisher stressed randomization, replication, and local control in experimental designs. These principles led to important contributions by Yates and others at Rothamsted to the theory and practice of survey sampling in the mid-1930s. They used randomization and replication, which make the sample design self-contained. That is, enabled estimation of the precision of the sample estimates solely on the basis of the information in the sample. Local control, that is stratification, 
was also stressed to reduce the magnitude of the sampling errors. Multi-stage sampling was introduced in the early agricultural sampling at Rothamsted, although in these early applications, the theory assumed primary units that were of the same size. The analysis of variance provided estimates of variance and estimates of the components of variance. Criteria were also suggested for jointly considering balancing costs against accuracy. In 1934, Neyman presented his now classical paper on the two different aspects of the representative method to a meeting of the Royal Statistical Society in London. It was a remarkable paper in which he presented the first well-rounded discussion of inferences from samples of a finite population on the basis of randomization, randomization introduced by the sample selection procedures, that is, of what is now known as probability sampling. The paper also contains a comparative evaluation of purposive selection and random sampling. He critically assessed the basic assumption which must be met if purposive selection is to give satisfactory results and indicated that the regression of the variable to be estimated on the control variables must be linear or nearly so and concluded that it is rather dangerous to assume any definitive hypotheses concerning the shape of the regression line. Confidence intervals were also defined for the first time in this paper. Neyman discussed best linear, unbiased, and consistent estimators, and noted that the method of random sampling allows a consistent estimate of the average of a variable x, whatever the characteristic of the distribution of the population. And he makes, and makes possible the estimate of the precision of the results obtained in the form of confidence intervals. He also discussed the use of ratio estimators and presented needed theory. He indicated that with large enough samples, the distribution of the estimate is practically normal, and thus there are no difficulties in calculating the confidence intervals. He emphasized that the important consideration is that confidence intervals be computed appropriate to the particular sampling selection plan and estimation procedures used without requiring that the estimation procedures be the best in some sense, or that the confidence intervals be the shortest possible. He noted that short confidence intervals are desirable, preferable to long ones, but in practical terms, it isn't necessary to seek the best. He provided the theory for optimum allocation of sampling units to strata in this 1934 paper, which he developed independently of Chupro, <coughs> whose earlier result in 1923 appears to have been overlooked at this time by statisticians generally. In 1937, Deming arranged for Neyman to give a series of lectures at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. One of these lectures dealt with the sampling of human populations. In the course of this lecture, Milton Friedman and Sultan Sidney Wilcox presented a problem concerning what has become known as double sampling or two-phase sampling. Neyman later considered the problem in some detail and presented the theory of double sampling in a paper in 1938. And in that paper, he introduced explicit cost functions in what was one of the forerunners of the joint use of both cost and variance functions to optimize sample design within a specified class of designs. In the late 1930s and early 1940s, a few major centers emerged for research in an application of sampling methodology. One was the Statistical Laboratory at Ames, Iowa. Another was the Bureau of the Census. At the same time, major advances were occurring in India and at a few other locations. Before discussing the work in the United States, I'll say a few words about the developments in India. P.C. Mahala Nobis organized the Indian Statistical Institute in the 1930s. Mahala Nobis advocated the view that it was imperative not merely to imitate procedures in advanced countries, but to adjust methods to the pre prevailing conditions of the area in which the survey was to be done. This, of course, is the appropriate procedure in sampling. That is, the methods used, in addition to focusing on the particular goals 
in the survey should identify and make use of relevant available resources. He developed a philosophy of what he calls statistical engineering and carried out designs in experimental stages over several years, developing and basing designs on cost and variance estimates. Among, among other things, he introduced a program of interpenetrating samples to help control and evaluate contributions to total survey error. Sukhotmi and the Indian Council of Agricultural Research also did a good deal of work on agricultural sampling and made various theoretical and practical, practical contributions, including some on stratified sampling. He also made important contributions concerning the control of non-sampling errors by showing empirically that small plots as used by sampling, as sampling units by Mahala Nobis for measuring crops were vulnerable to boundary biases that tended to include in a plot plants on the boundary that in fact should not be included. These biases led to overestimates that varied inversely with the size of the plot, and the biases in yield estimates could be substantial if small plots were used. Sakotny and Mahalanobis disagreed rather strongly on some of the practical statistical activities, and they carried on a more or less continuing controversy. Mahalanobis visited, visited us at the Bureau of the Census shortly after World War II, and we interchanged ideas and exchanged experiences. Mahalanobis made the ob observation which was surprising to me initially, but with which I fully agreed after learning more of his work, that the U.S. Bureau of the Census statistical engineering activities, as he referred to them, and those in his, in his organization in India were the only really similar ones doing large-scale surveys in the world. Both were concerned with total survey design based on empirical studies and covering not only statistical but operating problems and procedures. Nevertheless, both based designs on a strong theoretical foundation and the need to develop theory to meet new problems that were encountered. Mahalanobis had great influence in India and was a close advisor to Nehru. I first visited India in 1940, and he arranged for me to have lunch with Nehru, which was a great pleasure. I had the pleasure of making a second visit to India at Mahala Novus' invita <coughs> invitation in 1956 to serve on a review committee for the National Sample Survey. Ari Fisher was chairman, and the committee included Frank Yates, Toshio Kitagawa from Japan, and others. It was a remarkable experience, and I believe that Frank Yates and I were the only ones willing to challenge Fisher on some positions which he seemed to take to support Mahalanobis on possibly political rather than technical grounds. The Indian Statistical Institute had a strong statistical staff and was an academic training center as well as an operating statistical organization taking the na National Sample Survey and doing other statistical projects. Surveys of crop acreages and yields were being taken by the Department of Agriculture in the United States by the middle of the 19th century using relatively crude sampling and estimation methods. Advances using regression were introduced later and extended by Searle, Ezekiel, Bean, and others in the 1920s. These methods, with continuing improvements, are still in use, but supplemented and extended in important ways by probability samples. The development, the Department of Agriculture was one of the early organizations in the United States to initiate research and development work on probability sampling, and they established a cooperative research program with the Statistical Laboratory at Ames, Iowa. This was in 1938 and through the initiative of C.F. Sarl. It was a development that resulted in a group doing research on sampling led initially by Arnold King and Ray Jessen that has made important and continuing contributions to theory and practice and is also one of the few universities that has featured training in sample survey theory and methods as an important part of statistical training. Bill Cochran came to the laboratory in 1939 from Rothamsted, where he had been working with Frank Yates. I mentioned only a few of the contributions 
from the laboratory. Jessen published a classical paper in 1942 in, in which he investiga investigated the problem of approximating the optimum sizes of sampling units for agricultural studies. These studies, along with earlier work by Fairfield Smith, who I understand was here at Stores, guided development in cooperation with the U.S. Bureau of the Census of the Master Sample of Agriculture, which had numerous and important early applications and stimulated developments in sampling. The census participation put the master sample on a large scale because it was planned to use it in the 1945 census of agriculture. This also enhanced its uses for other surveys. The joint work contributed not only the master sample, but the opportunities for interchange, argument, development of principles, methods, and theory of sample surveys, and was an important part of our learning activity at the Bureau of the Census, and I'm sure stimulated the people at Ames also. Another development was concerned with the design of surveys to estimate population characteristics on two successive occasions. Jessen's 1942 paper presented the theory for optimum allocation on two successive occasions. And for the optimum allocation of matched and unmatched portions to the two occasions. This initial step stimulated the later development of designs and theory for rotating samples for surveys taken on successive occasions for time series estimation. In 1942, Cochrane made a particularly important contribution on their use of regression estimation in sample surveys. And in 1946, he extended work done by the Meadows in 1944 on systematic sampling. <clears throat> in 1936, the Bureau of the Census embarked on a limited experimental and research program on sampling and its important applications. A stimulus occurred on August 30th, 1937, when the Congress, with the st strong support of President Roosevelt, authorized a national voluntary registration of the unemployed and partially unemployed. The nation was in crisis at the time, and estimates on the magnitude of unemployment were wide-ranging wide and highly controversial, ranging from about 3 million to about 16 million. The field work on the voluntary res registration was carried through by the post office, and they did a remarkably fine job. Fortunately, a staff consisting of Sam Stauffer and Fred Stefan as consultants, and Cal Dedrick and others foresaw the lack of validity of such a voluntary registration. It would come from this tremendous uh, undertaking and persuaded the administration to conduct an enumerative check census in a sample of areas. This check census involved interviewing all households with a, a sample of postal routes, a probability sample of postal routes. The interviewing was done by the mail carriers. They also sorted the voluntary mail returns as though they were going to be delivered back to the families from which they came, to the households from which they came. And that made it feasible to identify the voluntary registration for the areas in which the uh, numerative check census was carried out. And this also made possible the use of ratio estimation based on the voluntary registration and substantially improved the estimates from the survey. With Cal Dedrick, I had the responsibility for summarization and interpretation of the results of this enumerative check census. It again was a tremendous learning experience, and it accomplished the goals that were intended to be accomplished by the voluntary registration, but that could not be accomplished by it. A prime result was the convincing demonstration of the usefulness of, sam of sampling on important national large-scale surveys. Such a role for sampling had been doubted and resisted by many, including some of the top staff in the Bureau of the Census who thought that sampling, rather than complete coverage, could destroy the reputation of the, that the Bureau had achieved for accuracy in its statistics, and that sampling was useful for others, but not to be done in the Bureau. 
they did not recognize some of the serious deficiencies that existed in complete census results. The voluntary registration was to take place by November 20, 1937, and the household canvas was done by the postal carriers during, during the first week of December. Remarkably, with the overriding support it received from the president on down, this massive undertaking, along with the preliminary evaluation from the sample, progressed at a sufficient pace that some preliminary results became available on New Year's Eve at the end of 1937. Kind of a remarkable performance, I think. Many of us worked all that night to make it possible, and I called my wife at midnight to wish her a Happy New Year. Well, the 1937 enumerative check census not only showed what could be done with sampling for unemployment, it contributed advances in, to advances in methods for measuring labor force participation, employment and unemployment, and various characteristics of classes of the employed. The effectiveness of the survey depended on ratio estimates of the enumerative check results to the voluntary registration, and we learned about ratio estimation the hard way guided by Naaman's paper and Naaman's 1937 visit. It was a stimulating and exceedingly fascinating experience and contributed much to the welfare of the U.S. and to the future acceptance of sampling, at least in the Bureau of the Census and I believe in much wider circles. This enumerative check census occurred shortly after the well-known debacle of the Literary Digest poll in predicting the 1936 presidential elections along with the successful performance of the Gallup poll in those predictions. The Gallup poll's success undoubtedly had, a, had the greatest impact on public acceptance of sampling, far more than the enumerative check census did. But the enumerative check census, nevertheless, was su supported by theory as well as intuitive considerations and set a strong precedent for future use of sampling in U.S. official statistics. The next major use in the Bureau of the Census was in the 1940 Census of Population. Consideration was already being given to the first use of sampling in the Census to collect supplemental information that could not be obtained in the complete Census at reasonable cost. The success of the enumerative check Census helped assure acceptance of this approach. Phil Hauser who had been brought in as assistant chief of the population division, was a stalwart supporter, along with Dedrick, Stefan, and others, in getting such an approach accepted. He brought Ed Deming into the bureau, into the population division, and we worked jointly, along with Fred Stefan, in developing the sample design for the 1940 population census. And this, again, was the beginning of an exceedingly rewarding and worthwhile professional relationship among all of us. The census was taken by listing successively on a, successively on a page one family after another and continuing to the next page one line to a person. The sample information was collected for persons listed on several patterns of pre-designated line numbers simultaneously with the collection of the information in the complete census. There were challenging problems of avoiding biases in this kind of a procedure because of the impact of the order of listing households and persons within households. Also, this procedure could not be fully controlled when the enumerator could, to some extent, determine the order of enumeration. Nevertheless, the biases that arose, you couldn't achieve uh, probability sampling in a, any rigorous sense this way because of the fact that the enumerator controlled had some impact on the order of listing. And that could be affected by whether the person was on a sample line or not. But nevertheless, the success of the undertaking laid the groundwork for future extensions of sampling and census taking, as well as in current sample surveys. That sampling would have an important role in census work of the future was now assured. Some notable, addi addi notable additions to the Census Bureau staff occurred during the 1940 census. 
including a number of highly qualified people who were rec recruited as clerks, people with PhDs, because of the depression could be recruited as clerks at that time. But some were soon, they were soon identified and given more appropriate assignments. Some others were recruited as professionals with mathematical or statistical or other related backgrounds. One who was recruited as a statistician was Bill Hurwitz. He and I began work as an effective team at that time that was far more productive than the two of us could have done working independently. And it was an exceedingly rewarding working relationship. A third major development in Census Bureau was to follow <coughs> that would strengthen the role of sampling in basic continuing surveys of national importance. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, the focus was on unemployment. And with the United States entry into World War II near the end of 1941, the statistical needs changed greatly and instead of unemployment, the focus was on employment. Steve Stock, Les Frankel, John Webb, and others had initiated a pioneering national multi-state sample in the Work Projects Administration, the WPA, to measure unemployment following the 1937 enumerative check census. After the US, census, U.S. entrance into the war, the WPA was abolished, and in 1942, this survey was transferred to the Bureau of the Census. We reviewed and undertook a revision of the survey design, and the outcome was to place the survey for the first time on a full probability sampling basis, along with the introduction of new, some new sampling methods and theory that enhanced the validity of the survey results, increased efficiency, and provided a design framework that guided many survey designs later throughout the world. A number of new sample design features were introduced along with supporting theory in this revision of the labor force survey, of which I will mention only one. The introduction of sampling with probabilities to proportion to proportionate to measures of size at successive stages of sampling was such that the overall probability of selection for the sample could be uniform if desired for each member of the population. This procedure had the effect of equalizing interviewer workloads and thus facilitating more effective administration, it also had the effect of reducing variances as compared with available alternative procedures. These probability proportionate to size selection procedures were combined with procedures for estimation that made use of supplementary information at the primary unit level as well as at the subsequent stages of sampling in the form of post-stratification to independent figures on the total population of the United States by age, sex, and race. The basic theory was provided for the complex sele selection and estimation procedures. We learned some interesting lessons uh, in the labor force survey, both during and after the war. In the initial design of the survey at WPA, it was a probability design at all stages of sampling except at the last stage. At the final stage in rural areas, random points were selected and households, a certain number of households nearest to those selected points were chosen as the sample. Uh, it was not practical by this procedure to know the probabilities of selection of the households at the final stage. When the measurements from the revised survey became available, which eliminated that procedure and substituted an area probability sampling procedure, they showed striking differences in agricultural employment from what had been available from the survey up to that time. Differences that were explainable after they were known to us by the non-probability sampling mechanism. The results substantially altered wartime manpower policy when the differences became known. Was the design was now such that it would re reflect changes in the population and they took place and didn't depend on any assumptions or assumed relationships as the earlier last stage of sampling did. In 1954, the Census Bureau undertook a revision of the sample design of the Labor Force Survey. <coughs> 
now known as the Current Population Survey because it had on, taken on many wider uses. By spreading the sample of, of about 25,000 households over a much larger number of primary sampling units, increasing the number of primary sampling units from 68 to 230. The transition took place in 1954, and there was great concern when the estimates came out uh, because there were an overlap in the two designs carried out, that uh, the estimates of unemployment differed substantially and far greater than could have occurred due to or be explained by sampling variability. After intensive study, including appointment of a review committee, it was concluded that differences arose because of the reduced supervision and training of interviewers in the original sample of 68 areas while extensive attention and training was being given to training the new interviewers in the new and much larger sample of primary units. Uh, the thought was that the interviewers for this short period had been well enough trained that the training and attention would carry over. The control of measurement errors had always been given serious attention. The original 68 area design was concocted on the grounds that if you had a supervisor in each area, you could get closer attention, and that was the way the design was administered initially. Closer attention and control than if you had a traveling supervisor. But we concluded when we went to the 230 area design that traveling supervisors of higher quality could do far better work and they didn't need to participate in the interviewing as such, which was done in the earlier approach. Well, after this big difference took place, we, and we concluded that the causes were control of measurement errors, new and increased procedures based on process control were introduced. These made use of sample inspection of the work of enumerators at periodic intervals. The inspection took the form of both observation and re-interview, in addition to an edit of all of the completed questionnaires. And uh, all of the errors identified in these procedures were fed back uh, in the form of taking appropriate corrective action. Another innovation was introduced at this time applicable, applicable to recurring surveys. This was a system of composite estimation. <coughs> sample rotation, well, along with sample rotation, and uh, used to improve both estimate of coverages and change over time. These procedures had been designed with supporting theory and introduced earlier in the Census Bureau's retail trade survey, but was adapted at this time to the current population survey. With the advances and success of the labor force survey, the next step was the extension of sampling to many other subject matter areas. The first eff eff <coughs> uh, effort sometimes encountered the attitude that while sampling would work with people and household sampling, where the populations were presumed to be relatively hom homogeneous, they would not work with business units that were exceedingly skewed kinds of populations. We were able to show how to take advantage of the skewness with appropriate optimum allocation of the sample and how to provide effective samples through joint use of area and list sampling, even in the absence of up-to-date lists. The sampling was successfully extended with new principles, methods, and theory developed as needed to many other subject areas, including manufacturing, retail trade, wholesale trade, agriculture, governmental units, and many other subject areas. Progress on these and later developments included many contributions from the ABLE statistical research staff that was recruited and trained at the time of the 1940 census and later. The reasonable control of measurement errors is a challenge in both censuses and sample surveys. A great deal of attention was devoted to experimental studies for the control of measurement errors in the decennial censuses. A number of experimental studies were conducted before and after the 1950 census, and in addition, extensive experimental studies were incorporated into the ongoing censuses, beginning with the 1950 census. <coughs> 
Included were matching studies to other records, to the prior censuses, and to births. Also during the census, there were separate intensive re-enumerations in a sample of small areas. One focused on evaluating coverage and another on content errors in the census. Also included were randomization studies in which two enumeration districts were assigned at random to individual enumerators within the experimental areas. Such randomization made it possible to estimate the variance of response errors both between and within enumerators, and thus the correlation of errors within an enumerator's work. Also included were self-enumeration studies in which respondents were requested to fill out their own questionnaires and the enumerator's role was greatly reduced. The design of the response error studies were guided by the development of response error models with supporting theory empirical evaluation of model parameters through the experimental studies just mentioned indicated especially the substantial impact of correlated response errors within the work of interviewers. These studies led us to conclude that correlated response errors within the work of enumerators in the decennial census constituted a serious problem, especially for small area statistics, and that self-enumeration substantially reduced these. The work of the editors and coders could be subject to correlated errors also, but could be controlled by quality, quality process control methods, as could the work of interviewers in continuing ongoing surveys. And for these, the contributions of correlated response errors were less serious problems. These results, with others that I will now describe, led to a revolution in census taking and subsequent censuses, with self-enumeration as the principal means of data collection. Shortly after the end of World War II, I was approached as the person in the Census Bureau responsible for research and development by John Eckert and, uh, by J Press Eckert and John Mockley, the designers of the UNIVAC, with remarkable proposals and asking the Census Bureau's support in building a large-scale general purpose computer. The Census Bureau had always been in the vanguard in the development and application of punch card equipment. With the participation of the National Bureau of Standards, we contracted to support the design and construction of the first UNIVAC. We participated in some design decisions, but had no real responsibility in that area. Delivery was accepted on March 31, 1951. Of course, we had been preparing for it, writing programs, and immediately put it to use 24 hours a day, seven days a week, on important parts of the data processing of the 1950 census. After the 1950 census, we placed the current population survey and other current sample surveys on the computer and began, began planning for the use of the computer on the forthcoming censuses of business and manufacturers, as well as the next decennial census. We also began developing new methods for taking the next census, for machine editing, for imputation of missing values, and sample estimation that could take advantage of the computer's capabilities. Of course, by today's standards, UNIVAC 1 was a massive and physical size and slow and limited in memory. But nevertheless, it was a sensational advance at the time. There were, of course, re remarkable computer developments to come. In planning the 1960 census, which began with the 1950 census experimental and evaluation studies, it was immediately clear that things were unbalanced if we had electronic computers for data processing, but still required hundreds of operators to manually key the information into punch cards. We had already discussed with IBM the possibility of developing mark sensing equipment for use in the 1950 census along with the anticipated electronic computer for data processing, which we didn't get quite as soon as we expected. After some developmental work, IBM concluded that they could not prepare the equipment for massive paper handling in time for the census, and the 1950 census data were again recorded by manual keying. We immediately discussed the problem with the National Bureau of Standards, and they undertook to participate with us in the development of mark reading equipment that could handle the massive data conversion job for the 1960 census. The result was FOSDIC, Film Optical Sensing Device for Input to Computers. 
The questionnaires were microfilmed and then read by Fosdick. Filming was proposed as a more reliable system than reflective reading of pencil marks. The equipment was developed, tested, and constructed in time for its highly effective use in the 1960 census. In order to reduce costs in the 1960 census, only a few key questions were covered in the complete census. Most topics were converted to a relatively large sample of magnitudes of 20, of 5, 20, and 25 percent. The 100 percent questionnaires were designed so as not to include any items that involved manual coding or editing. After extensive testing, we concluded that for the sample items, respondents would be asked to prepare their own responses on FOSDIC questionnaires. Special paper, paper handling equipment was designed, tested, and built to facilitate microfilming the approximately 40 million return questionnaires. The microfilm for the complete census items was processed through FOSDIC and the computer while the sample questionnaires were being edited and coded and subsequ subsequently processed through FOSDIC and the computer. Public cooperation was highly effective. Interviewers followed up as necessary. When these procedures, along with self-enumeration and others, were applied in the 1960 census, was the result was far more timely information as well as greater accuracy and reduced cost. Process control procedures were successfully instituted on the various phases of printing the questionnaires, microfilming, FOSDIC reading, and editing and coding of the sample returns. In many respects, it was a reasonably close approach to a well-balanced total design. The Census Bureau greatly benefited from the participation advice from a panel of statistical consultants with Bill Cochran as the chairman over the years from 1955 until I left the Bureau in 1968. Other members included Fred Stefan and Bill Maddow for the full-time period, Ivan Felagy from Statistics Canada, Ho Hartley, and others. All were exceedingly able, but we did not look to them simply as experts whose advice would simply be sought and generally followed. We discussed our issues and problems as, w as well as all phases of a total survey design experiment or census. We received much useful advice. They also learned from us. Cochran took the initial role in suggesting the creation of the panel of statistical consultants and it proved very beneficial. We had close and continuing personal as well as official relationships with the panel members. On evenings between the usual two-day meetings of the panel, we often had the panel in our home and enjoyed a drink or two, as well as good conversation, solving the problems of the world as well as the problems of statistics. Well, Cochran was indeed an eff exceedingly effective chairman. Few, if any, have contributed more to statistics as consultant, teacher, researcher, and author. I once took him sailing on my sailfish, and due to my lack of skill, turned over the sailfish and we came home, home wet and bedraggled. He asked for a cigarette and suggested maybe a fresh pack would be a reasonable compensation for what had happened to him. Fred Stefan was a highly effective statistical consultant over the years to the Census Bureau and to many others for, from the beginning of my participation in the Census Bureau. Ivan Felagy's participation in the panel was one aspect of cooperation between the U.S. Census Bureau and Statistics Canada. He came to Canada as a young Hungarian refugee. He has contributed importantly to the advancement of statistics and to the panel, as well as to Statistics Canada. He was just recently made the head of Statistics Canada. Bill Maddow was in the Census Bureau earlier, made contributions to sampling theory, notably to systematic sampling, was a joint author of what is now referred to in Westad as the Bible and continued as an advisor over the years. I've given only a brief review of a few highlights of statistical activities in the Census Bureau and elsewhere. The Census Bureau developments involved cooperation between top management, operating staff, and statistical staff. I became part of top management as well as promoter and leader of the statistical staff, and I believe this joint role greatly facilitated statistical progress. <laughs> 
Progress was also dependent on cost, constant questioning, why things were done as they were, or as they were proposed to be done. We regarded as important not to be afraid to be right, even the in the face of unanimous opposition, and to be willing to ask foolish questions. They often turned out not to be foolish. We learned that things that were known to be true on the basis of long experience often were found not to be true. Generally, decisions were made after examination of alternatives as well as extensive advanced development of tentative plans, testing, evaluation, and revision, with these applying to questionnaire design, sampling procedures, enumeration procedures, and all the other many aspects of taking censuses or major sample surveys. I left the Bureau, retired in 1968, and uh, joined Westat. I note with sadness that Bill Hurwitz died in March 1969. His leadership, insistence on high standards, and contributions cannot be sufficiently en emphasized. I owe him a great debt. There were a number of other contributors that I will only mention, uh, who are well known. Ed Deming, uh, Ho Hartley, Tura Delenius, Les Cache at various locations and activities. And uh, I think that's about all the time I have. It is now time to conclude our seventh Pfizer colloquium. We are most grateful to our speaker, and I would like to express our appreciation to him for an enjoyable and interesting presentation. Thank you.